Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us this second Sunday of Easter. Folks online, we welcome you to our service. I'm Josh Moore, I'm the pastor of the church, and I'm delighted that you've chosen to worship with us this morning. A um, couple of quick announcements as we get started here. Just uh, most of these, I believe, are, are in the bulletin. Um, next Sunday, which is the first uh, Sunday of the month of May, is uh, that's when we always have our potluck and we uh, commemorate the Lord's death and communion when we're together on the first Sunday. So just a reminder there. Um, also about soccer camp, I want to uh, let you guys know we're putting on our annual uh, free, emphasize free, uh, soccer camp for little ones uh, ages 5 to 12. And if you're interested in um, helping in some way, let me know. Uh, it would be delightful to uh, have uh, some help from our people. As every year we do, but there are many, many parts. And so I want to invite you to consider, uh, prayerfully consider helping in some way. Also, uh, something new that I'm letting folks know about is our Acolyte uh, class and uh, training uh, many of you have noticed uh, my kids have been performing uh, many duties, which they'll do this morning, uh, being acolytes. Um, but there's other things that are a part of that, kind of behind the scenes. And I want to invite other children to consider participating in uh, this, uh, in this uh, service, in this uh, very important role in our church's life. It's a way for the kids to get involved. It's a way, um, you know, they can um, serve the Lord. And, and learn a lot of things about the church and uh, service to God. So anyway, if anyone's interested out there with kids or grandkids, let me know. Um, be happy to, um, we're going to arrange a class and be happy to be a part of that. So uh, without further ado, let's have the acolytes bring the light in. Thanks, girls. As you feel moved, you may stand and say hello to your neighbors. <laughs> standing and we will together responsibly uh, say our call to worship this morning out of 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 3 to 5 your parts are in the bold Hallelujah Christ is risen He is risen indeed Hallelujah Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ He has given us new life God has claimed us as his own. He has brought us out of darkness. He has made us light to the world. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Let's pray together. Lord, we know that Easter is not uh, just a single day event. This is not, it was, of course, a moment in time when Christ was raised. But Lord, we remember that event every Sunday when we gather. And we walk every day, every moment, in the power of the resurrected Christ. I pray this morning that the risen Lord Jesus would be amongst us and that we would know that resurrected power, that by his resurrection, by that life that now indwells us in the person of the Holy Spirit, that we would be able to overcome uh, sin and overcome struggles in our lives, that we would walk in um, the power of the Holy Spirit. God, would that be evident amongst us, even right now, as we worship, as we sing, as we pray together, would we taste of this abundant life that we have in Jesus. We thank you that we are united to him and that in him we have risen as well. We celebrate that good news this morning. Bless this time as we sing together, as we rejoice together and pray together. Be exalted, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And uh, this morning can remain standing. It's my joy to have, uh, our joy to have Tim Frisch amongst us once again, a friend 
and uh, brother in the Lord, and I'm just grateful to have Tim uh, continue to be involved and to minister among us through music and in other ways. Tim has preached the word amongst us before here, and we're grateful that he's with us. So thank you, brother Tim. Great to be here. How are you all doing? Great. I want to read a few verses. Uh, when the kindness and affection of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not by works which we did in righteousness, but according to his mercy, through the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we would become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Praise God for his grace. In the 
service or out there today that has not tasted of that life. God, would this be the first time? We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Tim. Well, each month we take a moment to think about um, other believers across the world, um, challenges that they perhaps are facing, and we want to take a moment to pray for them. Just to be aware um, that the church is global, right? And it's easy to be lost and, and be myopic and focused on our immediate context, our struggles, our problems. Um, what a blessing it is to, to look beyond that. So we want to take a moment this morning and have what we call our missions moment. And Indonesia is the country we'll be taking a moment to think about. And our good dear sister Maggie uh, has put together another video for us on Indonesia. So take a moment, watch, and then we'll pray. Good morning, Rachel, brothers and sisters. How are you doing? Um, we're doing pretty good and uh, keep on missing you guys and pray for you. And um, this month, let's keep on praying for another new country, Indonesia. I don't know whether you're familiar with this uh, Eastern Asian country or not, but for me personally, I went there to visit some young missionaries from China and Indonesia. So this country really burdened my heart. That leads us to share with some of the facts with you. Indonesia is the world's fourth most populous country and the most populous Muslim majority country. It is one that arrived there and that I find this, this country is the most Muslim population in the world. Is that shock? It's not in the Middle East, it's in Indonesia. So how come? Um, I think at first Indonesia is a Buddhism country and because it's influenced by India and you know all the Buddhists in, in the Asia a lot, however, and um, 14th or 15th century people started to share gospel, their Muslim gospel, the Muslim good news to, uh, to this country and they uh, they success, successfully um, built up this country into a uh, Muslim country. So, uh, from this video, you will show, I will show you many facts of uh, this country that is uh, five years ago. However, it still gives us a pretty good glance of this country. So, let's come to watch this video first, please. Indonesia has long been 
been seen as a religiously moderate country. Its constitution provides for freedom of religion for six officially recognized religions. Islam, Catholicism, Protestantism, Buddhism, Hinduism, and Confucianism. However, by the end of 2011, at least 18 Christian churches were attacked and forced to shut down. What does that tell us about the religious tolerance in Indonesia? Despite the religious freedom that is granted to every individual in Indonesia, the government still fails to protect the rights and lives of many. According to a census in 2010, about 87% of the total population were accounted as Muslims, making them the most influential and powerful community in the country. It's okay, as long as the minorities do not face any persecution, but in recent years, Muslim militants have ambushed and attacked the Christian community at many different events. Among the many incidents, the most heartbreaking was the beheading of three 16-year-old Christian girls in 2005. They were on their way to school when six Muslim men brutally murdered them, leaving their bodies in the street, carrying away their heads to a different location. They were neither the first victims nor the last. Hundreds of such incidents have taken place throughout the decade. Around 500 churches have been forced to shut down. Many others have been bombed and ambushed, taking the lives of many Christians, not even sparing infants or pregnant women. The lives of those who they spared have been scarred for life. Like in 2014, a Christian family whose father was savagely murdered in front of their eyes. Imagine, if you will, what they must go through whenever they are reminded of that day. A Christian school teacher was also shot in front of his nine-year-old son. What's more depressing is that even after all these reported events, the government is doing little to protect those who are under threat, allowing the religious extremists to act more openly and relentlessly. The religious intolerance and persecution is increasingly spreading nationwide, have we become indifferent to the lives of other humans? Whether they live or die, has it become our slightest concern? Why do we allow these differences to blind us from embracing our similarities? And even if we do talk about other religions, don't they all teach us to attain peace? Something needs to be done about it. But a single person, on their own, cannot bring about the change. All of us, together, need to start caring for each other. And those who are more fortunate than the ones who are suffering need to constantly pray and work for countries like Indonesia. So as I said, Indonesia has the population of Islam people more than 90%. However, um, the government still uh, proclaim it is uh, a free government, free, a freedom on religion. But the persecutions here are quite severe. Even last year, uh, there were three attacks on Christians within six months period between 2020 and 2021, killing eight believers while Indonesian society has taken a more conservative Islam character, putting at pressure on Christians. So let's keep on praying for this country and let's pray for the believers in this country. So I've listed three prayer requests here. First one, pray for God's comfort and healing for those who are um, affected by the recent attacks on Christians. And pray for the Christians will be given wisdom and boldness as they follow Jesus in society that is taking on an increasingly conservative is Islamic character and also pray for the influence of the extremely Islamic group that will be snuffed out and ask Lord to reveal himself to those who oppose him. So, brothers and sisters, take your time, especially in this month, from time to time, pray for this country and pray for the believers there. Thank you. And goodbye. I miss you.
What do you miss, Sue? Um, Love Maggie. Let's pray. God, we want to take a moment and do just that and lift up our dear brothers and sisters in Indonesia. Or we know that some, even in our fellowship here, have faced a persecution at the hands of their government. We know how stressful and difficult that can be. We can only imagine. Many of us, most of us here can only imagine. Lord, we want to lift them up to you. And, and Lord, we also, we want to give thanks. You tell us in your word that even when we face trials of many kinds, we should give thanks. You tell us to rejoice when we are slandered or harmed because of your name. For great is our reward in heaven. I pray you would comfort those believers in Indonesia, those that are struggling, those that are facing these challenges, will comfort them with those words, remind them of their inheritance and, and glory. God, we do pray for their strength. We pray you would multiply their numbers. We pray, Lord, that you, by your Holy Spirit, would be at work, even amongst the, the Muslims. And perhaps, Lord, that you put an end to these extremist groups, these Muslim, more fringe minorities that uh, wreak havoc and and kill other believers in the name of their, of their faith. Oh God, we pray, we pray you would put an end to that brand of Islam in Indonesia and other parts of the world. Lord, we pray that the gospel of the good news of the love of God would spread across that land and that Muslims would turn to you. Lord, we, um, we love you. Thank you that you have had, taken pity and had mercy on us. We pray the same for our brothers and sisters in Indonesia. We lift these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I encourage you to continue praying for the believers in Indonesia as you feel moved. And now uh, in the season of Easter, we want to again draw our hearts and minds to the good things that the Lord has done. We're going to be reading a psalm each uh, Sunday, we've, and we've been doing this for some time now, I'm going to invite my wife for us to read our Easter season psalm, which is out of Psalm 150, which is a psalm of praise. Morning. All right. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud flashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. We can do that even in the midst of trial and difficulty. We, we know that many of our brothers and sisters, in, even in places like Indonesia, are praising God despite the challenges that they face. And uh, so we join our voices with them this morning and praise the Lord. I want to invite you now to um, pray with me. We'll go to the Lord together in corporate prayer. We're going to start our, our season of prayer um, this morning uh, by reciting something together. Um, you'll find it in your uh, bulletin and say it along with me. And even though it says amen at the end, I am going to uh, pray for another moment or two about some other concerns and burdens. Um, and then we'll move into the Word of God. So let's say this prayer together. We worship you, Jesus, our Savior. You conquered death by your cross. You are the stone rejected by the builders. You have become the cornerstone. Make all of us living stones in your church. We pray to you for Christians. May they live in the joy of the resurrection and be a visible sign of your presence by their mutual love. We pray to you for the leaders of your church. 
as they celebrate your resurrection with all your servants. May they be strengthened for your service. We pray to you for the leaders of the nations. May they exercise their office as servants of justice and peace. We pray to you for all who are suffering from illness, grief, old age, and exile. May your resurrection be a source of comfort and aid for them. In your name we pray, amen. Let's continue in prayer for a moment together. Lord, we want to take a moment, and you tell us in your word that we should cast our cares on you, for you care for us. Well, there's no fine print there, no footnote that says only these kinds of concerns, only ones of this degree of weight or gravity. No, Lord, we are to cast all of our cares upon you, big or small. So we want to take a moment to do that, Lord, we know some of our People here are in the midst of some really deep waters and some challenging things. We know others maybe are in a good season and feeling really great about life. Wherever we are, Lord, we want to come to you. So take a moment, whether you're at home, online, uh, or here with us this morning, take a moment, silently there, lift your burdens to God. Lord, as we think about our troubles, let us be reminded that we are in a season of remembering, celebrating, rejoicing in and participating in your resurrection. And, and really, every time we are together, we should remember and rejoice in your resurrection. So Lord, as we come up against difficulty of one kind or another, whether it be illness, some kind of bodily infirmity, struggle, whether it be relationship or struggle in our lives with someone that we're close to, family member, friend, neighbor, whether it be financial difficulty of some kind, whether it be just a deep concern over our nation or over our community or politics or some wrongdoing that we've observed. Whatever we come up against, oh God, would your resurrection be a source of comfort and help? And not just in the abstract, but would we know, truly know, in our hearts, in our minds, in our hands and feet, the power of your resurrection. Would we participate in your resurrected life? God, I pray, Holy Spirit, come. Fill us, strengthen us as we live in a broken and fallen and frustrating world. And we give you thanks in this season of resurrection. We are not without hope. We do not grieve as those without hope. As we long and groan in this world, we do so with hope. May our sorrow always be mingled with rejoicing. Oh God, I pray this morning, let us taste of these things. And we could go on, multiply many prayer requests and concerns about all sorts of things, Lord, but we lift all these unspoken prayers and burdens to you now 
in the name of the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, now we'll move into a time of hearing the Lord speak to us through his word. Whenever we are together in this way, it is right and good that we would open up God's word and hear him speak to us. You're not here to hear me speak or anyone else speak. We want to hear the Lord speak to us. And that's my goal, of course. Each Sunday as we open up God's Word is uh, to give voice to what He has to say uh, to us. So, and I hope that is the case. Uh, but let's say a prayer as we come to the Word of God this morning. Um, and I did notice a slight change um, in what uh, I have here and what's in the bulletin. Sometimes we have multiple edits and then it's printed before the edit's made or whatever. <laughs> So I want to encourage you to read what's on the screen uh, this morning so we're not, uh, you know, going in different directions <laughs> as we read the prayer together. Uh, so let's say this together. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Speak to us now as you have spoken to us throughout the ages. During this glorious Easter season, reveal yourself and your will for our lives, that we might live as your Easter people. We seek your face, O Lord. Hear our prayers through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise God. And now I do want to invite Scott Pupilo forwards, who's going to read for us out of Luke. Luke uh, 24, we're going to pick up right where we left off last week. Some of you will notice we, we were in uh, verses 1 through 12 on uh, Easter Sunday. We're going to pick right up where we left off and go to verse 49 today. So, thank you, brother. Hear the word of God. Good morning. Good morning. Luke 24, verses 13 to 49. That very day... Two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, 
for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hand and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they were still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer on the third day, Excuse me. Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. The grass withers. The flower fades. The word of our God will stand forever. Amen. Thank you for that great reading, brother. I like this story. My son is named after this story. <laughs> Love you, buddy. Sorry, I have I have the privilege of embarrassing my children from time to time. Uh, well, did any of you guys watch the old Batman and Robin episodes back in the day? Um, I don't remember who the stars were. I couldn't tell you all the details, those kind of details. But I remember watching it as a kid growing up. And uh, Felicia, you can pull up that picture there. Um, and uh, I, just, I just love this. Uh, I found this meme recently online in a pastor's group on Facebook uh, with all these cool memes and stuff. Or I think they're cool. Um, but back in those, you know, those early episodes of Batman and Robin, you know, there'd be a fight scene and then it would cut to a kapow or a, a thwack, you know, it would have this like call out and it would, you know, cut to a scene and have this big word. Uh, anyway, it was funny. And I thought this was, uh, you know, in the spirit of the season that we're in. This meme is not just trying to be funny, though it is very funny, but to capture the belief held by many that Easter is merely a single day event. We spend 40 days during Lent preparing, as some think, for just one day. How backwards is that? That we would mourn and grieve and repent and turn from sin for 40 days and then only rejoice in the good news of the resurrection for a day. Um, that's, not, that's not actually... Right, it seems kind of backwards, doesn't it? And the Christian calendar actually allots for 50 days for this season of celebration. So really, Resurrection Sunday is merely the start of this feast or this celebration we know as Easter. Easter will take us right up to Pentecost Sunday, some 43 days from today. So our worship will continue to reflect the 
themes of resurrection and victory over death for the coming weeks. This is why we're continuing to think about Christ's resurrection. And his resurrection really is an appropriate theme, as we've already mentioned this morning and prayed over. It's an appropriate theme every single Sunday, right? Which is sort of like a mini Easter celebration when we remember the life-giving reality of Christ's victory over sin and death. So Easter is a day, but it's also a season in the Christian calendar, and we have like a mini celebration of Easter every Sunday when we, when we get together as believers who live in the life and resurrected power of the Lord. And our passage before us this morning is very much in keeping with these things. According to the Bible, there was this period of time following Easter in which Jesus was on earth walking around appearing to people. He was teaching his disciples. He was preparing his church for a global outreach and doing other things. But Easter didn't just end when he rose, right? He didn't just immediately zip back up to heaven. Appear to a few people and whoop, right back. Nope. In our passage today, we're going to see Jesus is alive post-crucifixion and is walking about appearing to certain people. But this passage in particular is special. One very respected pastor and theologian that I like to read from time to time says that if he could choose to travel back to uh, in time to see just one event, any event in the Bible, he would choose to walk on the road from Jerusalem to Emmaus with these men and listen to them talk. That would be the place and the time he would go to. What is it here in this story that people like that find so remarkable? What is, what is it about this that's special? And on the surface here, there's nothing really tremendously significant happening here in this in this moment, two people, one named Cleopas, whom we don't know much of anything about, really, uh, is walking to a village called Emmaus, just seven miles from Jerusalem, which we also don't know hardly anything about. Not really much here to get excited about on the surface. A couple guys taking an afternoon stroll. This is not a David and Goliath story or a Samson and the Philistines or the building of the temple or Jesus multiplying the loaves and fishes kind of story. This is a story about a couple of pilgrims, probably disciples of Jesus, taking a walk down an old dirt road. Well, of course, they weren't just walking, they were talking as well, which maybe many of you do this when you go on walks with friends or perhaps your spouse. You talk as you walk. What Luke tells us simply, is that they were in deep discussion. Some translations have the word arguing. Some have reasoning, while still others have the word deliberating. The Greek word conveys the idea of an emotional dialogue. They were passionately, emotionally engaged in, in conversation. These disciples, these pilgrims, leaving the Passover celebration were engaging in serious discussion. Not talking about the weather. No, they were not talking about what they had for breakfast. Something had happened in the previous days at this Passover in Jerusalem, which they were leaving, that was truly unlike anything they had ever seen before, and they were discussing it passionately. And then Jesus shows up. And undoubtedly, this is why Luke wants us to know about this moment. Jesus shows up and says some extraordinary things and does some extraordinary things. We're going to see these two disciples encounter Jesus on that first Easter in some very important and special ways. But they are ways, actually, some of them, that you and I can also encounter the Lord today. And that's what I want us to see this morning. So the big idea I want to try and get across is this. Since Jesus is risen, we should expect to see him, air quotes, there in our everyday lives. He is alive, he's reigning, he's on the throne. He will show up in our lives. We will see him. Now to clarify, I don't mean that Christ is going to physically manifest 
himself to you as he did to these two disciples on the road to Emmaus. We will one day, all of us who are believers, will see him in the, in the flesh one day. But that's not what I'm talking about here and now. But there are ways that these disciples saw Jesus that we can see him today as well. In the first place, we can expect to see him in our everyday lives is in the Word of God. We will see him in the Word of God, in the Bible. Now, this may seem like a, you know, an obvious thing, um, but you'll see perhaps as I tease this out here that I'm, I'm saying perhaps more than what we, we immediately think. Now, there are three scenes in this story in Luke uh, 24 there that we, we just heard read. And the first one is the road there, when they're on the road walking. Then there's this story of them at supper, the scene where they're at, at having a breaking bread with Jesus. And then there's this encounter with the twelve at the end, um, near the end of the chapter. And in each of these three scenes, it is worth noting that the Word of God is put into focus, that we hear talk of the Scriptures. Luke is really shining the light on the importance of the Word of God in this story. The first scene is a scene on the road. And we see these two disciples walking along, again engaged in emotional discussion, dialogue, some kind of debate, or perhaps even an argument, reasoning with one another. And this stranger at that time, they didn't know who it was, shows up. And then we read in verses 25 to 27 these words. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Jesus tells these, these disciples here, of course they still do not know it's him at the moment, which is interesting to ponder. These two disciples on the road that day, Jesus tells them that the greatest book in all the world, the Bible, is all about him. Jesus is not an afterthought in the story of the Bible. He's not an appendix, something added on. Jesus is the main event. He's the central figure in the story. And perhaps what is most remarkable of all is that the scriptures at that time and place that these two pilgrims, these two disciples would have known would have not been the Gospels or the letters of Paul or Peter or John. It would have been what we today call the Old Testament. Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. These things, he says, are about me. And then in the second scene, that's the first scene, on the road, he says these things to them. Then in the second scene, at supper with these two disciples, Jesus breaks bread and blesses it and their eyes are open to see him and then he vanishes. What is the one big reaction that Luke leaves us with? These are things to, you know, to glean out of these stories and these accounts. What is the, the reaction that Luke leaves us with? Not, oh my goodness, did you see how he just disappeared like a magic trick? Oh, it was so cool, I wish I could do that. That's not their reaction. Might be my reaction. <laughs> Or my kid's reaction, but it's not theirs. Or they don't say, man, that was the best bread we've ever had. He sure knows how to cook. Or, you know, nothing like that, right? No, their reaction we see in verse 32. They said to each other, did our hearts not burn? Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? He vanishes. That is their reaction. Once again, we see the scriptures in view. Jesus was there in person with them, but it was in the preaching of the gospel, in the explanation of the scriptures, that these men say their hearts burned. Is that not interesting? Maybe there's something there we should ponder. And then, if that were not enough, the Bible is once again emphasized in verses 44 through 48, when he appears to the twelve. So again, kind of near the end of the chapter, we see uh, uh, Jesus and Luke pointing out the scriptures. These are the words, here's what he says in verses 44 through 48. These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that 
everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Jesus says, the Bible is all about me. I am the key, if you will, that unlocks the Bible's mysteries. I find it just simply fascinating that Jesus is there with them in person, but is pointing them to the scriptures to see him and know him. Is that not interesting? It would be like me picking up a photograph of myself and going like, hey, there I am. Well, I'm right here, but there I am. This is me. Jesus is doing that in a way here. He wants them to know that even though he has risen, he's going to depart soon, but they can still see him and know him in the Holy Scriptures. And this is what Luke wants us to see here as well. We can see Jesus in the same way. And we actually now have more than they did then. At this time, they would not have had the full New Testament that we have now. We are even more, in some senses, blessed in this way than they were. So I want to say, you want more of Jesus in your life every day, Study the Word of God. Look for Him, even when you're in the Psalms or the prophets. An interesting way to read the Psalms is to read them as the prayers of Christ. Try that as you are going through the Psalms. You will see Him in a new way. See Him in the prophets or the writings of Moses. Look for Jesus. Ask God to show Him to you. Notice from our passage in verse 45 that understanding how Christ was the key to Scripture was something that was a gift. Remember, they're on the road. And what does Jesus say? The first thing, when he's still a stranger to them in that moment, what's the first thing he says to them? Oh, foolish and slow of heart to believe. Right? So we need help. We read the Bible and we're like, what? We need help. Pray for that. Pray that God would open our minds to see his truth in the Word, to understand it. Pray that God would open your mind to see Christ in all of the Bible. And that's the first place we can see Jesus in our everyday lives, in the same way that these disciples on the road saw Jesus. The second place we will see him, again, air quotes there, is in showing hospitality. Showing hospitality. There's a painting titled um, Supper at Emmaus by a well-known Renaissance artist uh, who is called Caravaggio. And so I'd like uh, Felicia to pull that up for me. Um, Caravaggio is trying to capture this moment in verses 28 through 31. Get my little pointer out here. He actually did two different paintings of this moment, and this is the first of the two. And Jesus, of course, is the central figure here with his eyes closed and his hand extended. And the light is kind of shining upon him, and all eyes are looking at him. So the, you know, the idea really wants to draw your attention to, to Jesus as the central figure. This painting is life-size, probably about as big as it appears there on the screen. Um, it's five, six foot by six or seven foot wide. So it's a big painting. And the two men seated at the table, this really just blows me away every time I think about this. The two men seated at the table, the one here and this guy here, have just realized that this is Jesus sitting with them. Look at their reactions. They just realized, as he blesses the food, this is Christ. One is so overcome He's backing his chair up and also kind of leaning in at the same time. Like he doesn't know whether to jump for joy or be afraid. You ever done that? You sit at the table, something happens and you push your chair away from the table. That's almost what he seems to be doing here. Like, what? The other disciple has his hands spread out. There's kind of some debate. Is he, is he worshiping, you know, arms open, recognizing this as Jesus? Or is he in shock 
like, like what? Kind of thing. I mean, can you imagine? They've been walking with this stranger, and then all of a sudden, after he gives thanks for the food, they see this is Jesus. The man they saw brutally murdered and destroyed on the cross just a few days earlier. I'm going to say some more. I'll leave this up for another couple of minutes, Felicia, okay? I'm going to say some more here. Caravaggio wants to capture in this painting that very moment when they realized Jesus was not only raised from the dead, but he was right there with them in the flesh. The next verse, verses 31 and 32, say that Jesus then vanished and they began to recount, like we just said, how their hearts were burning within, within them as he opened to them the scriptures. Now later they run out and they get together with the 12 disciples and tell them what happened. And verse 35 says, then they told them what happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. So this moment here, they see. This is, this is Jesus. But one of the things I love about this painting is that it is inviting us in. Notice how there's an empty spot at the table. Just for us here. There's fruit right there almost falling off the table as if it's prepared for someone getting ready to you know, come to the table. Christ's right hand is lifted in our direction, an invitation. He's blessing the food, but also inviting. Caravaggio, the painter, is inviting us to this table with Christ and wants us to be a part of this supper. You do not need to be special to sit at this table. Notice how ordinary all the figures are. You can't really see it too great, but this guy here has holes in his shirt. This guy here looks like he's got a cold. His nose is red, right, which is really relevant this time of year. He's, he's got a red nose. This is ordinary stuff here, right? The room is plain. This is not a cathedral or a synagogue, or some religious space. This is a very common home, and yet there Jesus is, inviting them and us to eat with him. What a picture. I just love this. Hospitality is a very ordinary, everyday space that Jesus will often show up. And what an example we see here in these two disciples of Christian hospitality. These two eagerly long for this stranger to stay in their home and visit with them. Again, at the time they invited him in, he was a stranger to them. They did not know this was the Lord. They knew he had a lot of wonderful things to say about the Bible. But they did not know this was Christ. They invite him for a visit. Verses 28 and 29 say, so they drew near to the village to which they were going, and he acted as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. And that's even perhaps more remarkable, that the Lord responded to their request and dined with them. He didn't say, I've got more important places to be. He said, I would be with these very ordinary, tattered clothes, average people. I will be with them. You get the sense that after the, the, the great discussion, the intense discussion they had on the road, they were just truly longing for more time with him. Now sadly, most of us Americans are not very hospitable, if we're honest. If you've ever been to another culture, you've got some folks here from other cultures, and they would probably agree. Yep, yeah. Americans aren't the greatest at hospitality. At least not any longer. It used to be for a long time in America, so I'm told, my, I didn't grow up in a home that did a lot of this, probably because we were past that time and age when people did this, and we were city folk. Um, but there was a time in America you could just drop by someone's house and pop in for a visit and maybe stay all day. You could do that, right, at, at one point in, our, in history. And maybe even, uh, we read the writings of some of the founders of our nation and the early pilgrims that were here, and those that, were, that settled here and lived here for generations in those early you know, years, was not uncommon to travel. You'd have to stay at someone's house, right? There wasn't inns and motels and all this sort of thing. So people were accustomed to having people in their home for pe long periods of time, even if they were just traveling or passing through. No more. Today we value our privacy and our space more than we do showing hospitality.
two others. Maybe we'll have someone over for a cup of coffee, right? But we generally don't do much more than that. These two on the road to Emmaus opened their home to the Lord, even though at that time they did not even know who he was. This would have been part of the culture too. They did this um, more at that time. But there is something here for us. He was just a stranger on the road. But they invite him to come to their home and break bread. And the scriptures call us to do such as well. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2 says this. Excuse me. Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. For some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing it. Is that not amazing? And 1 Peter 4.9, we're going to be starting a series in 1 Peter really soon. 1 Peter 4.9 says, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Right? We're called by God in the scriptures to show hospitality. So invite someone over for dinner, right? There's some application for you. Have someone over for dinner. Yes, even though there is cases. That's the obvious question mark in the back of our minds. COVID is still a thing. Yes, this trumps that, in my humble opinion. Amen. Ask a person who is passing through to stay with you for an evening. We should be especially open to missionaries, Bible teachers, pastors, or others who have a special calling to proclaim the gospel message. This is one of those places where Jesus loves to show up. Loves to show up. Perhaps we are missing out on deeper fellowship with Jesus because we are not hospitable. Perhaps. And by hospitality, I don't just mean, okay, so let me clarify here, having people over to, to dine or, or to stay the night. Hospitality is much bigger than that. Okay, I think if we're thinking biblically, it can mean a general friendliness or openness, kindness to others, even strangers. This is rare, if I'm honest, being someone from the South who lived in a different culture for 30, 32 years and then moved up here. It's not a stretch to say folks aren't very friendly to, oftentimes, to outsiders. It's not uncommon. I can pass someone on the street and say, how's it going today? And I just get nothing. Okay, great. That's, that's common around here. And what's funny is, maybe this is sad, um, me and Megan, we're, we were out last night on, on a little date, which is a good, good thing to do from time to time. You married couples, be sure to do that. We went out, and we were walking through the Walmart parking lot, and it just dawned on me. I passed about four or five people, didn't say a word to any of them. And so, I'm, anyway, I'm being influenced here. No. <laughs> But that was not, you know, when I first moved up here, it's like, if I pass by someone, especially if it wasn't a crowd, you're passing a crowd, you can't, hey, 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 you know. But if it's one or two people, especially if we make some eye contact or we're in close proximity, I'd say, how's it going? You know, hey there. I didn't do that last night. And I noticed it probably because I was preaching on this, right, and thinking about these things. But anyway, hospitality is more than just having people in your home. More than just a cup of coffee or dinner. It's a general friendliness and kindness to, to others, especially strangers. And I want to exhort you to seek to be hospitable as these two disciples on the road were that day. That's another place where Jesus will often show up in ways that just blow your mind. When you open your heart and your home to others. The third place from our passage where we will see Jesus show up in our, and again, our everyday lives. I'm thinking of stuff that's everyday, right? Being in the Word, showing hospitality. This is not stuff that should be uncommon or foreign to us. It should be everyday kind of stuff. The third place from our passage where we'll see Jesus show up is in the ministry and the work of the Holy Spirit. We will see Him in the ministry and the work of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 49 with me now together. And behold... I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Jesus here is undoubtedly speaking of the Holy Spirit. One of the primary jobs of the Holy Spirit is to lead us to Jesus, to show us Jesus. Jesus says in John 16, verse 7, but in fact, it is best for you that I go away. 
Because if I don't, the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, the Counselor, the Helper, won't come. And if I do go away, then I will send him to you. Now it's not as though Jesus and the Holy Spirit cannot for some unknown reason minister to and help God speak at the same time, right? We can't be in the same room together. I gotta go back and then the Holy Spirit will come. No, right? They can work together. The reason, actually, I think, is eschatological, to use a big fancy word. It basically means the end times, referring to those last days. The Bible teaches in numerous places that the coming kingdom of God will be a kingdom that is characterized by the outpouring of the Spirit of God. We find this everywhere in the prophets. You can read all over the place in the prophets that in that day, in that those end last days, the Spirit will come and will reign. So if that kingdom is going to begin, Jesus must finish his work, which he did, and leave and go back to be with the Father at the right hand and the Spirit will then be sent to do all that the Scriptures have foretold. That is what is getting it. So that Jesus' work on earth is finished. He goes back and he's ministering to us in a different way from uh, the right hand of God. And today we see precisely that. What started out, right, as a ragtag band of disciples, just a handful, is now a movement that has encompassed the entire globe. That was not possible when Christ was here in the flesh on earth. This was made possible. Billions of people now call upon the name of Jesus because of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The last days are upon us. We are living in the age of the Spirit of God. But notice from those words in verse 49. What's the, what am I getting at here? Those words in verse 49, notice what is being clearly implied there. Jesus does not want them to jump out into the world without power without the presence of the Spirit of God in their lives. They need the ministry, the help of the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, to do the sort of things that God is going to call them and us to do. You cannot do what God is asking you to do without the Holy Spirit in your life. You can't do it. Perhaps some of you have heard the adage, which the men were going to talk about this morning, and then, we, then I remembered we had other plans. Anyway, long story. But we were going to talk about this expression, God gives us only what we can handle, right? You've probably heard that before, this old adage. Let me say unequivocally, that is not only unbiblical, but almost unthinkable for the Christian. There's not a day that goes by that I'm like, God, I can't do this. I am in over my head in one way or another. If you are a Christian and you are earnestly seeking God, then you will almost constantly bump up against things you cannot handle. Whether it's in your thought life or in your motives with pride. I mean, think about pride just for a moment. Maybe nothing harder to root out of our lives than pride. Cannot do it without God's help. We are so prideful and egotistical and self-centered as people. You need the Holy Spirit. And the, and the scriptures teach that this is often, God would lead us into these places. We're going to bump up against things you cannot handle because God has an agenda. God is wanting to do something in us and through us. And one of those big things is to teach us dependence on Him. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 writes these words. Listen carefully. We think of mighty Paul, this amazing Apostle who seemed to have almost unbounded boldness, right? Walk up into some place and just start going on about Jesus. Amazing boldness. Here's what he writes in 2 Corinthians 1. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. You ever been in a spot like that? I'd just rather die. I can't do this despairing. Indeed, he writes, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But why? He's wrestling with why did this happen? Why would God take me somewhere on mission to reach people and then this happened? Here's why. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. 
God wanted Paul and his helpers to depend on him, his strength, his power, not his own. Jesus is in the hard stuff, people. But God has given us power in the ministry and through the work of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is going to bring you back over and over again to Jesus. Because it's in the application of the work of Christ to our lives that we find this power. In other words, it's not, it's not as if the Holy Spirit just swoops in and makes us some kind of superhuman people who don't have struggles. That's not how the Spirit of God works. He doesn't just suddenly wake up in the middle of the night and criticism no longer bothers me anymore. Or, you know, I've suddenly can eat whatever I want and not get sick. Or, you know, my knee pain is gone. I mean, certainly the Holy Spirit can heal. God can heal. But this is not what is being spoken of here, right? What we're getting at here. The Spirit of God does not work in that way. And I'm being kind of ridiculous, right, in giving my examples, right? He doesn't just remove our, our struggles with anxiety. He doesn't just remove the lust. For you guys out there, I know women struggle with this too. It's not all of a sudden you just don't find women attractive. That's just, that's not how the Spirit works. It doesn't just remove the struggle. It's not as though our struggles just go away or things that were once hard suddenly are no longer hard. That is not how the Holy Spirit works. The Spirit of God works by bringing us back again and again to the work of Jesus Christ and applies it to our lives. For example, take Ephesians 4, 31 and 32 to give you some really practical example. He writes, this is a fresh verse for my family because we're working through these issues. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Paul does not assume here that the Holy Spirit just removes our struggle with unforgiveness and anger. You become a Christian, you get the Spirit, you're not angry anymore. No, he says, put it away. Stop it. Stop being angry, right? He doesn't assume that it just goes away. Why would God repeatedly say these things to us if he was just going to remove the struggle? That's not how it works. For us to overcome these things, we must realize what God has done for us. That's where it starts. We go back to the work of Jesus for us on the cross and the Spirit of God helps us remember and helps us forgive and helps us do those things which do not come naturally. He gives us power, but that power is connected to the work of Jesus. I can forgive and not hold a grudge or be angry because that's what Christ has done for me. And I come back to that over and over again. And God is applying those, those thoughts and those things to my life. The work of Jesus is always connected to the work of the Holy Spirit. We wouldn't even have access to the Spirit of God if it weren't for the work of Christ on the cross. So in this way, once again, this is my big point, in this way we see Jesus. Okay? The Spirit is leading us back over and over again in this way to Jesus. And this should encourage us. Sometimes we think, oh, if only I could have been on the road to Emmaus with those disciples. If only I could sit a while with Jesus. How many of you had that thought before? Driving down the road, I wish Jesus was in my passenger seat. I would talk to him about this and this and this. Get his, pick his brain about this and that. We don't need to think that way. We can. Friend, you can. Right? Christian, you can talk to Jesus. We have access to Jesus today just as those disciples did on that road. He's not in the flesh. We don't have that access yet. We will see him in glory in that way. But we have access. Because Jesus Christ has risen from the dead, because he is alive, we can see him and encounter him just as those disciples did on the road that day and at the supper. We can encounter him in the word of God. We can encounter him and see him in showing hospitality to others. We can encounter him and see him in the ministry of the Holy Spirit, day after day, moment after moment. 
That's what the Lord laid on my heart to share with you this morning. So let's pray to God. Oh God, we are so very much like these disciples. Disciples on that road that day, God, foolish and slow of heart to believe. Let me raise my hand first and say, that's me, God. How foolish and slow of heart to believe I am. Forgive us, O oh Lord. Grant us eyes to see Jesus in all of these places that we've just heard spoken. Grant us hearts that are filled with faith and filled with a burning. May our hearts burn just as those disciples did that day. May we know the power of the Holy Spirit as we seek to live for you and are often placed in situations that are beyond what we can bear. May we depend upon you and grow in grace, God. As we sing this final song and once again ponder all that you have done for us, would we encounter you as those disciples did on that road to Emmaus that day? On that day, you became for them not just a great prophet that taught with authority, but you became their living hope. You are alive, raised. O oh God, be for us today our living hope. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Stay together.
receive now together with me the blessing out of Hebrews 13. Now may the God of peace be brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for being here. Join us downstairs if you have a few moments. God bless you.